Remember I talked about active 24-7 people and the reserves called up when needed. This pretty much describes what's going on between the two. Um, so the active component means, like we said, 24-7. They're serving full time. You will hear people talk about active component. You will also hear active duty, AD. Uh, it all means the same thing, at least for the period of time that the service member was on active duty, AD. You can have people that are reservists in that federal standby force, or you can have people that are National Guardsmen in the Army and the Air Force anyway. Uh, and they will at times be called to active duty. So a portion of their service can be active, just like the active component of that service branch. Okay? Um, what it all means is they, they end up with, again, on that DD-214, that record of their service, they will have a tally of how much active duty they performed. Even though they might have always been in the Marine Corps Reserve, let's say. They may have a number of months and or years of conglomerated service when they were on active duty orders called up by the federal government. Okay. All right, so the, uh, just, just kind of big numbers down here. I uh, want to get you out of this. Is uh, A few years back, uh, the active component was over uh, one and a third million members. And it grew somewhat over the last few years and is now being tailored back down by 10 to 20 percent, depending on which service branch uh, we're talking about. So that 1.38 million will vary um, in the most recent year or two down to um, you know, as much as, uh, let's see, what would that be, 1.1 to 1.2 million instead of 1.38. So over a million. It seems like a lot, huh? But how many million people are in this country? Like 310 million, something like that? I'm not sure about my facts. Some of you that work in those industries might know. But a uh, very small percentage, huh? And, and, and even when you add up all the veterans, 2 million in the state of California, uh, how, many, how many people are in the state of California? Something like uh, 20, 30, 30, 30 million, 32 million, something like that? Hmm, two million, not a whole lot. Definitely less than 10%, less than 8%. So uh, it's no wonder that you don't always come across a veteran every day. But you guys will when you're sitting in here. I can, I can about guarantee it. Okay. This is what we touched on before. Uh, this, uh, well, no, I'm sorry. This is benefits while they're in the service. Um, especially if you're currently serving on active duty, whether you're in the active component uh, all the time or whether you've been called on to active duty from a reserve component, this is all the stuff that you uh, get while you are there. So uh, much like a, a good corporate package, in fact nowadays with, with the economy the way it has uh, evolved or whatever you want to call it, um, probably better than most companies as far as, uh, as, far as employment incentives go. And, uh, a, yeah, that's, that's something that's almost unheard of outside of government at this point, isn't it? So, um, yes, uh, extremely dedicated individuals um, um, to serve for any length of time. Those that commit to a career obviously had their eye on, on either just because they wanted to perform that dedicated service or more likely a combination of dedicated service, something they truly have a passion for doing, plus, oh, yeah, by the way, if I can do at least that, I'll get, I'll get some you know, continued uh, benefits um, in return. And uh, by the way, when we say retirement from uh, the armed forces, it doesn't have to be 20 plus years. The, the caveat to that is if a member is forced to retire before the 20 year point because of a medical condition uh, that they incurred while, typically that they incurred while serving, um, either, either due to their service or something that happened while they're on active duty, then they're still covered. Uh, the military recognizes their intent, and they will medically retire that individual with less than 20 years of service. So they will still get a similar uh, slate of benefits to the person that, that accomplishes that milestone of at least 20 years. Again, just for your awareness. Okay. For the active duty people, those that are serving continuously in the armed forces, or those that are called up to active duty, um, he, these are reasons why when they come here they might be a little 
less than happy uh, uh, when you start getting into talking about their service with them. Okay, uh, they have had to endure PCS, permanent change of station. A PCS means you pack your bags, you pack your family's bags, you sell your house, or you get done renting a house, and you drive, fly, take a boat to somewhere else on the planet, where you will then replant your family for two years, three years, four years, if you're lucky. And then you lather, rinse, repeat. If you are a, a career person, you will do that multiple times. Um, my wife and I lived in, I want to say, nine, nine or ten different houses when I was serving in the Air Force. And um, our kids came along about two-thirds of the way through that, so they've only lived in three different houses. So um, it can be a challenge when you are uh, trying to raise a family, and so that's a common source of stress. And it's something that isn't quite as prominent if you are a civilian going through job changes, uh, especially because if you're a civilian, you can say, no, I don't want to move there. I'll just stay with this job here. I'm happy in this position. Not so in the military. It's like, you have orders to there. OK. So yeah, it's, uh, it definitely can create, uh, can create a challenge for the member and their family. Um, temporary duty. Along similar lines, somebody has to pack their bags and go somewhere. Fortunately for the family, it's just the service member that packs their bags and goes somewhere for a few weeks or a few months or almost up to a year. Fortunately for the family. Unfortunately for the family, their mom, dad, brother, son, daughter has to pack their bags and be out of their uh, family's lives for a few weeks, a few months, up to almost a year. So, um, and we've all heard stories, you know, of, of Iraq and Afghanistan era veterans that have had to endure this. And it's very stressful, very difficult, especially if you are deploying somewhere for a length of time where there are known hostilities going on. So people are always wondering um, how, how that member is faring out there. This is constant, constant worry. Understandable. Okay, uh, let's see. Deployment. Um, this is the thing that beyond the temporary duty thing can be extended beyond a year. And it has only really happened in our current conflicts um, in the last several years when uh, large scale unit deployments occur where they have to be in combat zones for more than a year. Sometimes they're up to like almost a year and a half. And uh, this is probably the biggest stressor for the service member and their family um, across, say, the last 10 years. Okay, so the recently returning veterans, this is where you're going to see the biggest stressor in their lives is coming off of uh, deployment or deployments. I know quite a few service members who have been on two, three, four, or more of these things. They have missed out on a significant portion of life with their families if they have families. Many of them do. Okay, um, loss. You will definitely uh, hear about or see directly um, uh, a veteran, if they so choose and are able to talk about it, loss, perhaps within their unit. You may be speaking with a family member who has lost a loved one. Uh, an unfortunate consequence of, uh, of armed conflict. Okay, um, one that we have historically been mitigating over the years. But um, even when it's one, that's a significant number if you are the loved one of that one, obviously. All right, so be, be very aware of that one. Okay, uh, the military members uh, come from a different world. You just saw in all those other slides a different set of values compared to civilian counterparts a different set of expectations. And those expectations can also um, lead to, uh, you know, sort of a performance-related stress. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to shift gears when a service member leaves their respective service and they, they hit the civilian world and they don't have quite that same rigid guidance in their lives anymore. Sometimes um, the, 
the train tracks now just kind of blend in with the ground and the train can just kind of wander around and maybe stop at the wrong depot, if you know what I mean. So um, having that regimentation, having that discipline um, without question while you're in the service, while it's a, it's a um, boon, um, you know, a plus, uh, when they get out of the service, the new veteran is without that, for many of them, the first time in their lives as an adult, they don't quite know what to do next. They may seem a little jumbled up. They may seem um, without motivation at times. And this is probably the, the most difficult to identify, um, and, and really a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations have incorporated it in, even into their names or missions. It's a hidden wound. Uh, the veteran coming out of that world is now very displaced. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to start. Uh, frustration can ensue. Um, choices that aren't the best for that veteran's well-being can ensue. And, and now we are left with somebody who was dedicated to serving their country, who, by the way, was part of an all-volunteer force in this era, right, is now faced with uh, a multitude of dilemmas. And I guess it is, I know it is all of our jobs to help that person uh, identify where they need to go next. Again, they're not going to come here for professional services relating to behavioral health or even me medical health. But it will be your job to help direct them, knowing a little bit about a lot of stuff, where to go next. And you guys will learn about, even here at the grassroots level, where to locally help get them to for that, for that help, okay? All right. Uh, this is, uh, and this is more um, along the same lines. I'll just let you kind of read real quick. This is more about that transition. And um, another unfortunate factor that service members face, typically when they're coming back from a deployment. And a lot of them come back from deployment and they get out of the service, all at the same time, especially in the reserve components. If you are a member of the Army Reserve or the Army National Guard, that was your full-time job for X number of months overseas in a combat world, and you come back, and not only are you coming back from the combat world to the US of A, you're also coming back from the full-time military community to the, I'm a straight civilian again. I got my uniform is off. And now I'm looking for a job, or I'm looking to go back to school, or I'm looking for trouble, or I'm, I don't know what to do. Okay, it's the double whammy, the newest returning veterans. We are starting, finally, figuring out how to properly care for those that had come before. Uh, obviously, very long overdue for the Vietnam era veterans. We are finally figuring that out. And it's a good jump start this time. I think we are all rallying together to make sure the younger, the newly returning veterans uh, are not faced with the same unwelcome home problems that the Vietnam veterans faced when they came back. 